We're talking about Evil's Masterstroke Revealed. This is part two. You know, as the papacy rose to power back in those early centuries, never before had the world seen such an unusual combination of religious and political power as that which now ruled from Rome. But Daniel chapter 8 verse 12 goes on to further identify this power and foretell how it would actually cast down the truth to the ground and trample on it. Daniel 7.25 And he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High for a time and times and half a time. Now here Daniel clearly predicts something else, something new, that this little horn power would bring about great persecution. Did that happen? History shows that from time to time, both Protestants and the Catholics have persecuted those who differed from them. I mean, just look at Northern Ireland today. But Daniel is referring here to the little horn power, which we have seen symbolizes the papacy. And it's no secret that the Roman church, the medieval church, our church, persecuted those who disagreed with her. And unfortunately, we call it the Dark Ages. And the Catholic Church itself admits that this is the case. Quoting from the Western Watchman, St. Louis, Missouri, December 24, 1908. The Church has persecuted. The Donatists were persecuted and sometimes put to death. Protestants were persecuted in France and Spain. We have always defended the persecution of the Huguenots and the Spanish Inquisition. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. This is sad to have to confess and look at, but during those dark ages, literally millions and millions were condemned and martyred for their opposition to the established church. Estimates put the figure at over 50 million people. But please notice something else. Daniel 7.25 predicts that this persecution of the saints would continue specifically for a time and times and half a time. Bible scholars have long understood that this refers to a period of 1260 years. A time in the Bible equals one year of 360 days. Times equals two years or 720 days. And half a time? Well, that equals 180 days for a total of 1260 prophetic days. Well, you remember that in symbolic prophecy, a day represents a literal year of real time. See Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. So 1260 prophetic days equals 1260 actual years. Well, we've already seen that the papacy achieved full recognition by 538 A.D. by a decree of the Emperor Justinian. So from 538 A.D., well, 1260 years would take us to the year 1798. Friend, those were the long years of papal supremacy, of papal persecution, when the Roman Church ruled the world. Well, did something occur in 1798 to stop the persecution and bring an end to Rome's power? Put on your seatbelt. Let me show you how accurate Bible prophecy is. In 1798, look at it in history, France, under the armies of Napoleon, overthrew the power of the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. General Berthier, a French general, 
took the Pope prisoner in 1798. The power of the papacy was crushed. The Pope was prisoner over there in Avignon, France. And no one was sure he was even alive, so they elected another Pope back in Rome. And then the two Popes mutually excommunicated each other, and a third Pope was elected. It was an incredibly messy scandal, referred to in history as the Babylonian captivity of the church. It was horrific, and it was ugly. But Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 also speaks about this, saying that the papacy would receive a deadly wound. And it did. Until 1929, up in our days. What happened in 1929? Well, you see, Revelation also said that the deadly wound would be healed. 1929? Did that happen? Just take a look in history. What happened in 1929? General Benito Mussolini, Italian fascist, statesman, and prime minister, restored the power of the Vatican. So that today, in Rome, we see that the Roman Catholic Church is again a prestigious position to speak and to have the whole world listen. Here in America, we've even had the Pope come to address the U.S. Congress. In my day, the deadly wound has been healed. But what else did Daniel predict in Daniel 7.25? Let's take a look at the remaining prediction the prophet makes concerning this little horn power. He says it would intend to change times and law. In other words, this power would attempt to change God's holy law, the Ten Commandments. Well, does the Roman Church claim the authority and power to change the divine eternal laws of God? Listen to one of their own quotations from Lucius Ferraris in Prompta Bibliotheca, Article 2, called Papa, page 29, quoting, The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine law. Now listen carefully. Here is what the Catholic Church itself says regarding the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to Sunday, the first day of the week. In fact, if you enroll in instructions to become a Catholic, you're giving a catechism with questions and answers. And here's what the Catholic Catechism says, quoting word for word from Peter Geierman, Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 50 question is asked, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, well, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to to Sunday. Now here's another statement from Reverend Stephen Keenan's A Doctrinal Catechism, page 174. Question. Have you any way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. These are amazing statements. The Catholic Church says, we changed the Sabbath day from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. 
not because there are any scriptural basis for doing so, not because God said to make a change, but because the church decided to make the change in God's law and has power to do so if she chooses. Now look at this amazing statement from the church's official newsletter. This is down now here toward our day, Our Sunday Visitor, March 7, 1971, quoting, Seventh-day Adventists still keep the Sabbath, and we honor them for their logic. But it is difficult to see how the people who proclaim that they take their religion from the Bible and the Bible only can reconcile their observance of Sunday as the Lord's Day. You can go through the New Testament with the finest of fine combs and not come out with one verse that justifies or that even mentions the changing of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Catholics take their beliefs both from Scripture and tradition. Each is basically the Word of God, the one written, the other handed down orally from generation to generation. In this particular instance, it is only tradition that tells us that the infant church buried the Sabbath and chose Sunday as the Lord's Day. How did this change to Sunday keep happy? How did it? Let's do the. Let's turn the, to the. Go to the change. Okay, in five, four, three, two. How did this change to Sunday keeping happen? How did Satan organize and launch his master stroke of evil? It may startle you to know that the custom of Sunday keeping did not originate with Christianity at all. It had its origin in pagan sun worship. After the apostles died, there was a strange mingling of paganism and Christianity. And Christians were eager to, to win new converts. They saw all the pagans and said, Let's win them over to Christianity. But right here, the Christian church made a mistake. Christian leaders began to compromise truth. Uh, they reasoned, you know, if we permit these pagans to bring some of their customs into the church, they'll be more willing to become Christians. How right they were. But oh, how wrong. The pagans came into the Christian church in droves. And as a result, the church became more pagan than Christian. These new converts felt right at home because the church let them bring with them such practices as confession to a, a priest or prayers for the dead, idols, and the worship of saints. Oh, if they adapted these rituals to fit into the Christian faith, but it was still pagan. It was a masterpiece of Satan's power, and it diluted the truths of the Bible. As pagans came into the church in large numbers, well, the seventh day Sabbath quickly began to suffer. You see, Sunday has always been a pagan day, the pagans always worshiped the sun on Sunday. Most pa pagans worshiped the sun on the first day of the week. Well, well, Christians were worshiping on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Well, what to do? Well, for a time, the Christians began to celebrate Sunday too, but it was a popular public holiday, a fun day but they continued observing Saturday as the Holy Sabbath. Well, this seemed to satisfy the pagans, but soon people began to look forward to Sunday since it was a holiday, a fun day. And they came to feel that, well, the Sabbath was boring and dull because the church had made it a day of fasting and prayer, too many restrictions. So you see, Sunday was emphasized more and more and the Sabbath, less and less. 
History tells us for a time Christianity was really confused. Many Christians kept both Saturday and Sunday holy. But then something major happened to make the change official. Then Roman Emperor Constantine, pagan Constantine, decided that since everyone was jumping on the bandwagon and becoming a Christian, well, he himself would be more popular if he too became a Christian. It was a political maneuver. And in 321 AD, Constantine issued an important decree that greatly altered the world's history. A few strokes of his pen put into effect a universal law declaring that Sunday would henceforth be the world's official day of worship. It's recorded in history. I'm quoting from none other than the History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 380, by Philip Schaff. Quote, from the Emperor Constantine, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. Satan rejoiced. I mean, he was ecstatic. He had been successful in substituting another day for God's holy day day of the seventh day Sabbath. Now, by law. Well, you know, they didn't have fax machines and cell phones back in 321 AD. So news of the change didn't reach some areas of the far out Roman Empire for hundreds of years and even more. In fact, in some areas way down in Africa or Britain or Ireland, the Alps, the Seventh-day Sabbath continued to be kept for hundreds of years. Did you know that St. Patrick in Ireland kept the Seventh-day Sabbath? Because the news of the change hadn't reached Ireland when he was a monk. We're now learning Sabbath was even kept in the Pacific Islands of the sea, including Hawaii, until the Jesuit priests centuries later came and told them they had to change to Sunday. But Christianity as a whole now officially kept Sunday in honor of the resurrection, they said. And they ignored God's commandment to keep holy the seventh day Sabbath. Johann Gutenberg hadn't invented movable type until 1453, so few people had Bibles to read or check. Through many centuries, when the scriptures were not available to ordinary Christians. The church simply taught through its priests, Sunday is the Sabbath. Now friends, even today when Bibles are plentiful and Christians are able to read and study for themselves, Satan still tries to mislead us with his master stroke of evil. He still tries to persuade us that we are honoring God the Creator, by keeping the counterfeit day he has set up in opposition to God's commandment. Why does Satan hate the Sabbath so much? Why did Satan attack the Sabbath way back in the early days of the Christian church and convince Christians to substitute Sunday for God's seventh day Sabbath? It's because of what Sabbath represents. It's the day that points us to God, to the Creator, to the one who made us and our world and everything in it. The Sabbath points to Calvary and the cross. Sabbath is God's sign of redemption. Sabbath helps us remember that God is the one who recreates us into his own image through his salvation and grace. The Sabbath is God's appointment with us, a special day for worship and honor and spiritual growth. Satan wants to disrupt that fellowship and communion with God that takes place when we worship on the day that 
God has sanctified and set apart to meet with us. Satan wants our loyalty, you see. He wants us to honor him by accepting his counterfeit day. Satan wants us to acknowledge his power by choosing to obey him rather than God. That's always been the issue. Choice. God or Satan? You see, friend, God is waiting for his people to accept him, to accept his word, to accept all his commandments. He wants to be able to say to his universe, look, here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. The question is, will we accept the Bible or tradition? Will we follow the command of God or the command of men? Today, God calls on us to choose between the Creator's day and man's day, between truth and error. Oh, Sunday may, may be more convenient. Most Christians may keep Sunday. But you see, that isn't the question. The question is, will we obey God? Will we follow Him in all things? Without stretched hands, Jesus says to you and He says to me, if you love me, Keep my commandments, John 14, 15. By the grace of God, let's choose to follow Jesus and keep his Sabbath because we love him. Mm -hmm.